humans have been interested in the idea of how life came into being, how life originated on Earth. My project this summer was something that could provide us insights that help, may help us find out the answer to this problem a bit easier. My name is Ayush. I'm a second year undergraduate in physics from India. And I did an internship this summer under Dr. Henderson Jim Cleves, we call him Jim, Dr. Jim. So let's get started without any further ado. So here's the thing. Some scientists think that life possibly came into being when simpler organic molecules reacted with each other, merged, and formed more complex molecules, such as glucose, nucleic acids, amino acids, and some other important life essential molecules. But again, one could say that's just a hypothesis. Scientists like to test their ideas as rigorously as they can. How do we test this idea? To figure out whether or not simpler molecules can generate more complex molecules, you need to study them in a lab. For experimental chemists, I would say this would be a terribly difficult problem. If you drop in one molecule and let them react, they will end up producing millions of compounds in, in your beaker. Identifying each one of those millions of molecules may be impossible. So what we did was we used a computational technique to model our reactions on a computer. What's the motivation? How do we know this is actually gonna be worth it? How do we know that prebiotic chemistry might actually have anything to do with something that is real? It turns out that people have already found some, some of the simpler organic molecules that we suspect might be important in the origin of life in the samples obtained from meteorites which are present at the time the Earth formed. All right, so since Siddhant already explained a bit about what we used, the tools that we used, I'll briefly go through this without diving into much detail. What we did was we used a tool called MOD. It was a tool written in C++ with the Python bindings, and we used it to generate our reactions. We start with an input molecule. We apply certain reaction rules, as Siddhant explained. Those reaction rules direct us to some products. There are some transformations made in given molecules, the molecules that you start with as an input, and the transformed molecules are your products. We keep applying these rules over and over again. We do this multiple times. We keep doing it iteratively as long as we can. We call each cycle a generation. When we're done producing, we have what is what, what is called a reaction network. It looks like the thing on the left side. It all looks a bit messy and it actually gets much more messier than that. This is actually the result of just one cycle of generation. When you do two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, five cycles, at each step, the, the number of products increases exponentially. So this thing becomes really computationally expensive and we needed, needed more minimalistic, more simplistic approach to be able to compute these products with less computing power. When the molecules are generated, properties are calculated, such as the mass of the molecule and the small string of the molecule, the in k string of the molecule, and these are stored as attributes to the nodes in, in the graph. After we're done generating, we do a kind of filtering to avoid bad structures. As I said, we want our simulations to be as chemically realistic as possible. In the left, you can see a molecule that has an unstable substructure. If you see that three member cycle, a carbon cycle, that thing is unstable. And what we decided was, if you see any such thing, if you see any such unstable substructure, get rid of it. Also, to reduce computational costs. For the purpose of our studies, 
it was sufficient to restrict the maximum molecular weight of any molecule to be no greater than 200. This reduced the size of the network by a large amount, and it, that put us away from combinatorial explosion, one step away, actually. So that's, about, that's all about how we generate it. But what did we do with that? There were two reactions that I would particularly like to talk about. I actually did more reactions, but these two are some of the more important ones, and I wanted to talk about them as I have results to share, and I'm sure you'll be fascinated. The first reaction is the degradation of glucose in alkaline medium. Alkaline medium is basic medium. You may ask, why start with glucose? Why glucose? Glucose is, I think, the most important carbohydrate in the entirety of biology. It's involved in so many cellular processes. If you can study the network of glucose degradation, as if you have taken organic chemistry or if you studied chemistry in high school, you might know that any reaction that goes forward has a chance of going backwards as well. If we can figure out how glucose degrades, we can go backwards and see how glucose might have formed. So that's an interesting thing. The other reaction we studied was the foremost reaction. The foremost reaction is a fancy name for reaction between two compounds, formaldehyde and glycoaldehyde. If, that, if those names confuse you, look at the structures on the right. This reaction, people know, can produce glucose. As I said, simpler molecules merging together and producing more complex molecules that might be life essential. This reaction does produce glucose and we confirmed it again. Something else that we did. You said, you, you'd say, okay, you generated reactions. You used a uh, re really simple kind of primitive tool for generating reactions. It could be producing so much stuff that is wrong, outright wrong. The post-generation filtering we do is a small part of figuring out what structures are bad and getting rid of them. Another thing that we did to figure out whether or not our inventory of reaction rules is complete or not, we did that by finding data in literature, existing chemistry, chemistry research literature. It turns out that these two reactions that we picked in particular have been studied, studied extensively by chemists. So we found data of structures that have been reported that are formed when these reactions happen. In the left, you see a plot of what percent of the structures that were reported that we were able to match by our simulation. As, as I said, we applied the reaction rules iteratively multiple times, and each time we apply it, we call it a generation or a round. Within just four rounds of generation, although we had to make our rules more concise, within just four rounds of generation, as you can see, we were able to match 96.15% nearly all the molecules in the test set for the foremost reaction. Not only that, since people have found out that it may produce glucose, I try to check, or is our network producing glucose from the foremost reaction? Yes, it is. Another thing, I also studied the glucose degradation. On the right, you see a plot for the degradation of glucose. So, since glucose is, much, is a much more complex molecule, the chemistry involved is much more complex, the number of compounds that can be formed is significantly larger than the foremost reaction, we were able to match only 60% of the structures that in our test set, not to mention our test set for glucose was larger, we were able to match only 60% of the structures for that. So there's a problem with these um, analytic reports, I think. The thing is that the techniques that people used for detecting these molecules in a test set that people reported, Yang, Montgomery, Decker, Sweer, and Omran et al., the stuff that they reported is not complete. 
analytical techniques are only so good. We needed something that was more complete. And one such thing that might be more complete that, that we can identify most of the mass of the most of the stuff in our re reactions um, happening is mass spectra. So we found high resolution FTICR mass spectra for the, the glucose degradation. Although we did find data for the foremost reaction as well, I haven't really done it much with it yet. So I'm not going to talk about it right now. For the glucose reaction, it turns out we were able to match very few, a really small fraction of the total uh, data points in the mass spectra. The reason being, as you can see in the, in the uh, spectra on the left, that spectra is not, not, not the data that we obtained. It's just uh, a plot, a bot plot, you can say, of the reaction that we simulated ourselves. On the horizontal axis, you, you see the exact mass. As it, and if you can notice, as I told you, we put a limit. The highest mass we were allowing in our simulation was 200. Beyond that, we have no masses. But our mass spectra had masses up to 1,200. Not to mention, the mass spectrometer using the technique, due to the technique it uses, is insensitive to masses below 150. So we weren't able to get any masses below that. And we, were, we weren't able to get masses above 200 either. So we were able to match a small fraction of the, of the mass spectra. That might be a pretty upsetting thing. But it turns out the problem is the computational expense. We plan to take this, thing, this work forward. As I told you, the foremost reaction might produce glucose. And we think that the, at some point, the glucose degradation network and the foremost reaction network may converge. I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's pretty much all I have to say about the analysis that we did. I would like to acknowledge my professor, Dr. Henderson Jim Cleaves, who helped me enormously and was so supportive throughout the course of the project. I just could not believe I was working with a scientist who is well known in his field and is working at a problem at the forefront of his field. I'm also so grateful to receive technical support from one, from one of our collaborators, Dr. Jacob Lick Anderson of the University of Southern Denmark. And not to mention, I would like to acknowledge the wonderful experience that my fellow YSP project mates gave me. Romulo, Alejandro, Jessica, Siddhant, Rana, Thank you all of you guys. And also I would, like to, I would like to thank BMSIS for this wonderful opportunity to be able to, to do work on something meaningful and to be able to produce scientific knowledge, although a bit, a very small fraction of it, a very tiny amount of it. Before I leave, I would like to talk a little bit about what the future holds. I told you there are possible ways reaction networks might converge and they may, produce, they may give us insights on how different reactions probably could lead to a common major product. Some reactions could favor the production of, of one molecule. More primitive um, reactions could uh, uh, go on to produce more complex molecules like glucose and we could have yet more sophisticated networks. In the future, we would like to improve the chemically realisticness of our simulation. The way we do that is um, if you've taken chemistry, if you've taken thermodynamics, you'd know that if you know the heat of formation, you can tell whether or not the product is like, likely to form. So we want to estimate thermodynamic parameters to determine whether or not a reaction is feasible, whether or not a product is feasible, that will help us clean out a lot of the redundant stuff that we're producing. That will make it more chem chemically realistic. So Dan told you that we are also looking at autocatalytic loops. That may tell us about like which particular reactions that are bound in a loop are producing the most stuff. And a lot of them could be producing things that are the majority because some autocatalytic loops may be faster than others. They could have greater turnover rate than others and so on. So we want to estimate kinetic parameters to see if these reactions are fast. 
the, the kinetic parameters for us is a little bit difficult, although the thermodynamics part is easier. You can use Benson group additivity formula for that. Kinetic, kinetic parameters part is more sophisticated. With that, I'd like to ask any questions. Thank you so much for the extensive time that you gave. gave. Any so questions? I would like to go in, with, I would like to chime in with a question. Wonderful talk. Hang on, hang on. Uh, 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 is it Sudan? Okay. Uh, who's that yeah, speaking? It, like, yeah, Sudan. Yeah, sorry. Okay, go on. So, uh, wonderful talk again. Like, nice wrapping up all our project. It was nice that we were just behind one each other and we completed all the project. So, as the question that was asked to me, what according to you was the most difficult part to compute or was the most difficult part that troubled you? I think initially the first part was identifying how to what technique that we want to use. There's so many techniques, there's density functional theory approach, there are so many different ways. There are molecular dynamics approaches, React NetGen by some uh, group in um, no, uh, no sign and normal university, I don't remember the name. That group uh, actually made something that uses molecular dynamics trajectories to um, do simulations. The thing is, they can sustain that for only a really small amount of time. Something minimalistic like MAR that we're using is perhaps the way to go for this kind of network. Figuring out what works was perhaps initially the most time consuming part. After you get to that, it's pretty easy. What, for our project, in our case, the thing was MOD gives us what we ask it to do. It gives us products based on the re reaction rules that we wrote. It's not hard to produce the network itself. It's hard to make sure that the Net, the chemistry is realistic. So it, the harder part was looking at our output and trying to see what went wrong, what's producing chemical and unre unrealistic stuff, what's producing gem diols, what's producing, let's say, bicyclic stuff, what's producing maybe some ethers that were not supposed to be in there. That was the harder part. Doing something that matches real life chemistry was not sacrificing for physical reality or chemical reality for this purpose. That was the hardest part. Any other questions? Thank you for the questions. I, I'm actually like happy people are asking technical questions. This is something I wanted. Thank you so much. Ayush, can you anticipate what kind of planetary setting you could see that would allow the formation of glucose? Uh, good question. So, what kind of planetary setting might allow for the Two formation of glucose? <laughs> yeah. To be fair, I am not certain of what chemical, uh, sorry, uh, what planetary conditions could favor a glucose formation. What we did was we designed a reaction rule such that we favor the reactions that happen more often in alkaline medium less than um, um, uh, alkaline medium more than those which don't happen enough in alkaline medium. For example, we have ester formation and hydrolysis. Formation happens less often in chem chemical medium, uh, in basic me medium. The K equilibrium is like 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth. So we turn that, we turn the rule for ester formation off, we turn the rule for ester hydrolysis off. So the reactions that we are using, they could happen in the acidic medium as well. What planetary settings could possibly favor glucose more? That's a question um, maybe my professor could ask better, answer better, to be honest. No problem. Thank you for considering it. Uh, thank Any you very question? much, Ayush. Uh, we're okay, going to okay. move on to the next speaker. But, uh...